William Scott Rita Jr. And very good evening for you, because I understand that uh, for the torture from Russian TV and radio, you had to wake up like at three in the morning. So it's three in the morning in the United States, and I really appreciate it. And uh, in about a week, actually eight days, we'll be celebrating your birthday. So you're going to be a birthday boy. So in case I won't see you exactly on your birthday, very happy birthday. We are quite Thank amazed. Uh, we're quite amazed in Russia because uh, you're well known for your uh, furious tempo, extreme knowledge of subjects that you're discussing, and that uh, American officials uh, could not argue your very, very deep expertise on a lot of questions when you criticize them. So they decided to destroy you personally. And they put you through personal hell, and they tried to destroy your reputation, and you suffered a lot, and still they could not break you down. And now during this crisis, you are still trying to tell the world the truth, not Russian or American point of view, but your point of view, the way you see it as a military expert with the very deep knowledge of uh, military positioning of both uh, countries and both armies. Why are you doing this? Why are you still trying to uh, get all possible trouble from the American government on you personally? Well, first of all, my objective is not to get in trouble with the American government, the Russian <laughs> government, or any government. So that's not the objective. Um, I, I have a certain background in uh, military affairs, intelligence affairs, etc. cetera. Um, you know, I didn't call people and say, hey, I have, a, I have my opinion. Uh, people called me and asked me my opinion. And if it's a subject that I can uh, deal with responsibly, uh, credibly, uh, then I will respond. And uh, I think that's what happened here. Um, I was approached by uh, outlets to write articles about um, what was going on between Russia and Ukraine. Uh, this led to uh, various podcasts calling me and asking me if I would come on and discuss this. And um, ever since then, that's that's what's happened. I mean, to give an example, I didn't call you and ask to be on your show. You exactly. called me. Exactly. Um, and so here I am. And if I can answer a question responsibly, I will do so. If I can't, I will tell you I'm not in a position to, uh, to answer that. And if this gets me in trouble, so be it. <laughs> <laughs> but you do know Russia and Soviet Union quite well. Your thesis is a long time ago on uh, Basmachi movement and your knowledge of very specific part of Russian military history is very profound. And that gives a completely different perspective also of Russian character. Based on your knowledge and your assessment, how do you see current situation on Russian-Ukrainian front line, what will be potential development? And where is the end? And how soon we'll see the end of this military operation? Well, I think we need to start with reality, which is uh, Russia has defined this as a special military operation. So this is not war. If this was war, there would have been a general mobilization and Russia would be applying I believe, a, a vastly larger amount of resources to this problem. Russia is applying significant resources, but uh, there are limitations, especially in manpower. And as much as I respect the Russian military, uh, they're not supermen. Uh, they are capable of only so much. And we, we are facing a situation, we need to respect Ukraine's capabilities. It's a large country with a very large military, a very well-trained military, um, and they're fighting. Uh, they're losing right now, but they, they are fighting. And when you fight, uh, not only do you suffer casualties, but you inflict casualties on the other side. And Russia has been uh, engaged in some very heavy fighting. Uh, they're prevailing right now, but not without a cost. The question is, how much longer uh, can, can Russia sustain this? Um, you know, and that's, that's a question I don't have the answer to. I don't know what Russia's reserves are. I don't know how much ammunition they have left. Um, Russia's doing well right now, but the fight isn't over. Uh, the, the Donbass still needs to be liberated. There still is the question of denazification. What does that entail? 
um, and demilitarization. I think now that the Ukrainian uh, government has decided to receive significant quantities of NATO weaponry, um, demilitarization can't stop until all of these weapons are um, are eliminated. Uh, and the Ukrainian military, uh, to the extent that it has been trained by NATO, um, must be demobilized. Uh, this is There's a lot of work left to be done. I mean, the Russian military has done a fantastic job from a military point of view. They've They've won some very impressive victories, and they appear to be on the verge of winning more victories. But there's a lot of fighting left. That's for sure. But uh, I never, well, basically in uh, military history, probably there were quite a few examples of that. But in modern day history, it's quite amazing to be able to achieve what Russia achieved with, uh, you know, ratio one to three. When on one attacking, we have three defenders. And that's what we're facing right now. And we're still uh, finding our way to victory. But what's in it for the United States? What outcome of this uh, military operation is for the United States? When the United States is going to say, okay, come on, we can see that military victory over Russia is not possible because Putin obviously told them, guys, it won't happen. If we have to, we'll do whatever it takes. And we can take as much torture and as much pain as you can imagine, and we'll still go and win the war. Because it's not the war with Ukraine. It's the war with the West, with NATO. When Americans going to say, well, that's not what we expected? Well, I think America's saying that's not what we expected right now. Um, I don't believe um, people thought that Russia would be able to a, stay in the fight because of economic sanctions. There was a lot of uh, emphasis placed on um, the, the ability of uh, the United States and the West to defeat Russia through economic sanctions, that Russia would never be able to get its military operation um, underway uh, because the economy of Russia would collapse. So this has absolutely failed. It's the economy of the West that's having some difficulties right now, and the Russian military is doing quite well. I think there's also a growing realization that no matter how much resources are, um, are, are turned over to the Ukrainians in terms of weapons, money, etc., uh, the Ukrainian military uh, will not be able to turn this around. Uh, there will not be a Ukrainian military victory. The best the West can hope for right now is a stalemate uh, where Russia... Uh, is able to achieve significant, um, you know, results in the Donbas, maybe in parts of southern Ukraine, etc., but uh, is unable to finish the task. That's the hope. Um, but I, even there, I think some people are starting to realize that this is unsustainable in the West because, again, economics. Um, Russia can continue the fight longer than the Western economy can continue to support uh, Ukraine. But ultimately, this isn't about Ukraine. I think you hit it on the head. This is about a larger struggle between uh, the United States, the West, and Russia that gets into issues such as um, Vladimir Putin. Um, I mean, in the United States, we have demonized the Russian president. Uh, we treat him as a cartoon character. Um, and we have policymakers who um, have built an American policy towards Russia predicated on the need to get Putin out of office. Um, you know, if you remember the reset, uh, the, the infamous reset uh, uh, under Obama uh, back in 2009. Right, the, yeah. Uh, when, when they misspelled not, the right word. Yeah. <laughs> they misspelled. Yeah, well, Instead the of reset, they put over uh, church. Future ambassador Michael <laughs> McFaul. Uh, but <laughs> the point is, that wasn't a reset policy. That was a regime change policy. The purpose of that policy was to promote the presidency of Dmitry Medvedev so that he would re re remain in office, become a tool of the United States. And I'm not saying that Medvedev would have done this. I'm saying what the objective of the United States was, uh, keep Putin out of office, is fail. By its failure, the United States um, you know, is unwilling to admit that we failed. We are continuing to try to undermine uh, Putin. And by doing so, Russia, one of the problems is, in the United States, we don't talk about Russia as a nation. We don't talk about the Russian people. We don't talk about Russian culture, Russian history. Everything is boiled down to one person, Vladimir Putin, and we don't even get him right. <laughs>
That's uh, very true, but at the same time, only 8% of Americans right now are interested in what's happening in Ukraine. So as it usually happens, it's like an you know, early start, and then we forget. So American psychology is like this. Wow, it's in the news. Two weeks later, come on, get me the other news. So it's like clip mentality. So they don't want to be focused on this problem when we're talking about people, not about political establishment. But it's not about Putin. You're absolutely right, because support of uh, Putin by Russian people nowadays is enormous. And the amount of uh, people that are willing to go and fight this uh, special military operation is tremendous. So we have basically to stop them, because too many of them. But what happens after Ukraine? Because obviously our main objective is strategic stability of Russia. In America, do they see the perspective? We will not tolerate any threat to Kaliningrad. We will not tolerate any threat on the Baltic Sea or in Arctic region. And we, if we have to go, you know, all, all distance will go all the distance. Well, I mean, ultimately, that's the uh, that's a conclusion we don't want to uh, reach. Neither you <laughs> nor me, um, and I don't believe anybody in a responsible uh, anybody who's responsible in a position of leadership uh, seeks that. But it is ultimately um, one of the risks of this kind of confrontation between the United States and Russia. Look, the United States, as you said um, accurately, uh, we are the people. Uh, tend to be very superficial when it comes to foreign affairs, et cetera. We're more concerned about what's happening here at home. Uh, there's an old saying that dates back to the time of Bill Clinton, uh, put out by James Carville, um, it, it, when talking about the American people and politics. And it's uh, it's the economy, stupid. Meaning, yeah, that Re remember that campaign. Stupid. Yeah, that, that's yeah. economy, stupid. Yeah, that one him the, Yeah, that one him the chair. So, yeah, so yeah, he got yeah, the well, White House. It will win most people the White House because that's really what the American people are focused on. If you keep us happy, if you keep our roads looking good, if you keep um, goods in the store, prices of gas low, you tend to do well as a politician. We don't get too caught up in foreign affairs as long as it doesn't um, have a direct impact. The Ukraine conflict, however, is having a direct impact here at home. Um, and you're going to, I think, see in the near future, uh, Americans start to question, why are we involved? Why are we doing this? Is this a price we're willing to pay? Uh, and once they start asking those questions, politicians are going to have a difficult time answering those questions. And it's at this point where you might see the potential for a transformation in the outlook of the United States vis-a-vis uh, -vis its relationship with Russia. I don't know if in the near term our two countries can ever be friends. Uh, too much bad things have happened, but we can be friendly. We don't have to be enemies, and we can start uh, to work in peace. It's not going to happen with the current uh, political group that's in charge here in the United States, but they aren't going to last very much longer because it's the economy, stupid. And our economy is not doing that well. That's that's very true. But also, if I may say so, I think that uh, February 24th is a result of uh, arrogant American position during negotiations with Russia starting on December of 2021. And that's why Trump is absolutely correct when he's saying that under his government, there won't be such turn of position. So he will be able to get Ukraine to do what they promised to do during Minsk agreement. And uh, it won't be so rude and absolutely unacceptable for Russians. The kind of negotiation that uh, Biden team were trying to held was obnoxious. So you, you, you don't talk like that with the Russians ever. But I think that American I'm not, government I'm not is... going to disagree with you. I, I think that the approach of, um, look, it, it's not unique to Biden. Uh, I, I think the Obama administration was very, um, was very childlike in its approach towards Russia um, and had the ability to be uh, dismissive of Russian concerns. Um, the Bush administration prior to that, George W. Bush, was likewise, um, we, when the Soviet Union collapsed um, in the decade of the 90s, uh, during the time of Boris Yeltsin, 
I think the United States was um, conditioned to view Russia as weak and to view Russia as a nation that could be bullied, could be pressured, could be yeah. pushed around. Um, and the United States lives in this nostalgia, and we resent somebody like Vladimir Putin who refuses to, uh, to play the role of, uh, of a Boris Yeltsin. And we don't know how to respond to that responsibly. I think Donald Trump, for all of his faults, and there are many faults, especially as an American looking at his, uh, you know, what he did here domestically from a political perspective, not a good thing. But anytime you have an American leader saying, why can't we be friends with Russia? What's wrong no, with that? No, no, no. <laughs> That's not a bad question to ask. <laughs> No, no, no. We've heard that once. No, no, no. You know, nowadays Americans will have to earn trust and it won't yeah. be easy. Uh, Scott, what do you think? Is there like, you know, remember the last days of Nazis when they were all waiting for Wunderwaffe? Is the miracle <laughs> weapon that NATO can provide to Ukraine to turn situation around? And do they realize that uh, basically we have response to whatever magic wand they're willing to hold to Zelensky? That weapon-wise we are much more advanced even than NATO itself. And we have quite a few wonders in the box that we haven't unwrapped yet. Although we showed for NATO a couple of uh, very, very dangerous toys, starting with our hypersound technology and a few more. Uh, no, there's no such thing as a wonder weapon. War is fought and won by, um, <laughs> by men and women nowadays, but primarily men in the trenches. Um, it comes down to the capabilities of the soldiers, the capabilities of their leadership, and the uh, righteousness of their cause. Um, you know, Nazi Germany had some very good soldiers, but their cause wasn't uh, wasn't a righteous one, and they 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 were defeated. No wonder weapon could save them. Um, Ukrainians likewise have some very good soldiers, but their cause is not righteous. You can't fight in defense of the Bandera ideology and say that your cause is righteous. And there's no amount of weaponry that can. Um, that can fix this this fundamental problem with the uh, with the Ukrainian cause. There are no wonder weapons in NATO. Uh, you know, and if we did have wonder weapons, um, we wouldn't be able to train the Ukrainians on them. And to be honest, if I were an American, the last place I'd want these wonder weapons is in Ukraine because uh, the track record shows that not only does Russia destroy them, but eventually Russia gets their hands on them. And uh, I don't want to turn these weapons over to the Russian government. Uh, so the this is pie in the sky stuff. The United States has con consistently believed that we could solve any problem by throwing money at it. Um, this Ukrainian issue is not a problem that we can solve by throwing money at it, either money directly or weapons pr uh, pr produced with money. Uh, the Russians are on the right side of history here. Uh, as I said earlier, there's a lot of fighting to be done and a lot of suffering yet to occur. But uh, the Russian cause is just the ukrainian cause is not just and i think at some point in time the united states is going to have to recognize that and deal responsibly with russia about uh, the new reality i mean because uh, a russian victory in ukraine does create a new reality in europe one that nato and the united states must address um, there is a need to relook at a european security framework that respects russia's uh, legitimate national security concerns that doesn't mean you roll over and play dead but, you know, when you sit down with somebody, it must be from a position of respect. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why all these negotiations failed in the past, because the United States didn't respect Russia when they sat across the table from them. I think Russia is earning a lot of respect right now. What make you say that a Russian course is just? Because that's exactly what they're trying to argue Biden and his Russophobic team of uh, uh, different so-called experts on all possible levels of, Ukra of American government? Well, I mean, we just start with, uh, you know, I don't want to go into the entire history. I think uh, President Putin gave a couple speeches where he, he addressed uh, the history going back to Lenin. So I'll, I'll leave that to the Russian president. Um, but we'll just start with uh, the Maidan in 2014. If uh, any objective uh, historian will look at Maidan and realize that this was a Western instigated coup against a legitimately elected democratic president of Ukraine. And um, this coup brought in, empowered um, this very virulent 
um, right-wing ideology, uh, Ukrainian ultranationalism, neo-Nazi ideology, and the supporters of Bandera, that um, then proceeded to carry out um, the brutal repression of uh, ethnic Russians in Ukraine. Um, and this led to not only horrific crimes in Odessa, but uh, horrific crimes in Mariupol and in Donbass um, that caused uh, ethnic Russians uh, to, to declare their independence. Um, I mean, Russia is literally defending Russians. That's, um, that's why it's a righteous cause. And it's defending Russians against an ideology, uh, the Bandera movement, that has links, historical links uh, and ideological links to, uh, to that of Nazi Germany. And as an American, um, I take umbrage at anybody who says we need to defend Ukraine. That means we're defending the ideology that my grandfathers, my uncles fought against. And, um, you know, while I'm not here to sing the praises of Russia, I am here to condemn uh, Nazi ideology and the ideology of Stepan Bandera. And in this case, Russia's on the right side of history. Thank you so much. And the last question. По-русски хорошо говорите? Нет. Сожалею, нет. Моя русский язык очень плохо. <laughs> well, because when I studied your you know, background and I saw that you had to work with uh, very specific literature that requires almost excellent knowledge of Russian language. But I'm very impressed. Uh, thank you so much and thank you for, for your time. I've been honored. And if it's not uh, against your plans, I'd love to talk with you uh, in the coming future. Конечно, большое спасибо. 